and I can't wait for all the nine months. Uh, is it nine months? Up till November, we're going to be having this session. So I'm excited. Are you excited? You don't sound excited. People who are excited uh, uh, do better than that. Are you excited? Yeah! yeah! Awesome. Great stuff. So without any wasting time, I'm going to welcome our chairman to quickly come up front and um, uh, welcome us, and then we can start with the business of the day. Round of applause for our chairman, Tate Maurice Khadebe. Thank you, thank you very much. This is the prayer that has uh, carried us for over 100 years. And uh, that is why we have uh, avoided a civil war in this country uh, through the leadership of Nelson Mandela. And we are now going through a major challenge in this nation. And uh, we've uh, gone through technical recession yesterday. Uh, we've got high unemployment, poverty, but I believe that we will succeed. Do you believe that? It's people like you and me that are going to make sure that this country does not become a failed state. It becomes a state that is going to be successful and thrive. We will go through challenges, just like in our own personal life, we do go through challenges, but uh, we always have to triumph. Do you believe that? I like uh, Africa is on a corner, a corner. It's able. They are able. All right. Uh, welcome again. And uh, this is our first one this year. Uh, so I can say compliment of the new season to all of you. Uh, and we're going to be running them as, uh, as, as we'll be making announcement at the end. But I just very privileged today that we, uh, before I, feel, I forget, We've got, we promote also uh, uh, African authors at the back there, uh, outside. Uh, there's a young man there who's uh, showing books. Uh, go and have a look at that, and, um, and, and, and if you can buy one, it will be helpful. All right. Uh, I'm very, very privileged to introduce uh, who, uh, in, in, in the political circles, we call him MJ. 
MJ. Uh, he's been a, a leader in our nation. Uh, he's uh, spent all his life in service. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, we look at politicians, obviously some of them are, are not uh, good politicians, but they, uh, is a good politician who is committed to serving the people of South Africa. All his life he spent there doing that. And uh, I thought for a long time we've been inviting business people here and business leaders and let's le get political leaders uh, so that uh, uh, our young lions like Abu Andil can also identify the political leadership. Andile Yangbona. Yeah. Uh, and if you've got a political DNA, we need political leaders, uh, which will ULP is going to groom so that they become ethical uh, and also purposeful and very, very clear in direction and serving our people. So, Babu MJ, Babu Ujuanis Masangu, uh, is a former ambassador of the Republic of South Africa in the United States of America. Man, you go to clap hands for that. <laughs> I remember when our uh, President Ramaphosa arrived in the U.S., uh, he was chaperoning him, you know, every, every place. And I saw him there, and I, my wife and I had the privilege of visiting them in Washington and spent some time with them. It's been such a great pleasure. Being a little no mama, my son, my Let's clap hands for her. And my wife there at the back, I must always acknowledge her because we're all here because of her. Thank you. In the late 60s, he was the president of student Christian movement in the Eastern Transvaal, then uh, now part of Gauteng and Pumalang. So he also come from the Christian background. Uh, I also was once in the student Christian movement. Uh, and he served as an assistant secretary general of the Transvaal United Teachers Association. He was one of the leaders that play a critical role in the process leading up to the first democratic South Africa. These were what I call midwives uh, of, of our democratic South Africa. He was a negotiator at the CODESA, and multi-party negotiation forum in the executive council. He was elected to serve in the National Assembly in the Parliament of South Africa as a representative of the African National Congress. He became the, the member of the Constitutional Assembly, the body that drafted the Constitution. So this man was right there, right drafting clauses of the Constitution. I think let's give him a round of applause for that. We've got a, 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 a Royce Royce constitution. Sometimes it's so good that I wonder whether a young democrats like ours need a, a, such a good constitution. But you, you did a great job in, in drafting that constitution. Uh, he chaired the uh, Constitutional Assembly's core group and of the theme committee of chapter four, dealing with parliament. During his tenure as a member of the National Assembly, also served as a chairperson of House of, Commit of Committees. He's married to Noma Swazi. And they're blessed with five children, two daughters, and three sons. And how many grandchildren? A lot. <laughs> I must get your sons to work hard. <laughs> but he's also been, he's also, I am, I'm privileged to call him doctor. He's been given an honorary doctorate by university uh, in, the Amer in America, it's Southern? Southern Southern University. Let's give him a round of applause for all the work that we've done. <laughs> so, Bamatlang, over to you. Come and share with us uh, what uh, you have in store for us. Uh, is the technology working? Is his PowerPoint presentation there? Somebody going to work for him? All right. So, how is he going to see it? You must, you've got to get the, the, the laptop. It's, it's all right. We'll we'll go, will you look at it? You'll manage. Yeah, I'll manage. Thank you. Thank you. San Bonan. Abshed. Good evening. Good evening. 
huyenan. <laughs> That's very soft. Eh? <laughs> now let me let let me start by uh, saying to Baba Hatebe um, and the fellow participants here, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, all of you, that uh, I really appreciate to come and talk to you tonight, being invited by um, our distinguished leader, uh, Mr. Morris Hadebe. Now we know each other from many, many years. Uh, we've been meeting in meetings in all, all, all corners of South Africa and uh, I respect him for what he has done. Uh, I don't want to tell all the stories today uh, some of the stories belong to me and him, but thank you for in, uh, inviting me uh, to come and talk to you, LP, uh, Chairperson of ULP. Now, I have realized that some of your objectives, you committed to upliftment and uh, to the development and motivation of young people. That's what I've realized when I glance through and reading uh, from your website. And I take my head off for you tonight for inviting me this evening to come and speak to this wonderful group before us tonight. Just before I start with my presentation, let me just start with the pres what the president said during the State of the Nation address. I don't know how many of you do go through that State of the Nation address, not watching on television and looking at the MPs, how wonderfully they address and those people who are visiting there, but really reading the document. Are there people who read that document of the president? Do you read it? Just be honest. You don't read it. Okay, fine. Just take time to read that document because it's very important. Because what the president says, he says what has he done with his government the previous year, and he commits himself to what are they going to do the current year. Now the people who need to oversee government are you sitting here. Why oversee government? Because you have elected government into power. And so you are the people who must oversee that. Now, this is what the president said. I want you to listen to just these two quotations. I'm going to quote him open quotes. He said that, among other things, government was... And secondly, he said that government was developing new innovation ways to support youth entrepreneurship and self employment. Those are the two things that are key that the president has mentioned in his speech. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us that the country is now moving away from many other things, but focusing on the young people so that they become participant and involved in the economy of the country. That's what the president says. And this, if you are to be involved in the economy of the country, therefore you've got to be ready to do that because you can't be involved when you have not ready yourselves to be involved and participate in the economy of the country. When you participate, it means the opportunities are there. Now, you've got to go out there when you are ready and really seize those opportunities and make use of them because government creates the environment for you. And you've got to go there in an environment that is workable in doing whatever you want to do in participating in that economy. But let's take those two, just two words out of what the president said. The main issue is economy, and the other one is innovation. Now, I think you've put the slide on now. 
Is it on? That's right. The economy and, and innovation. Those are key words that I have picked up that I just want us to talk about this evening. Now, what I want to say is that the future belongs to you. Mr. Hadebe has done his part, I've done my part. I'm a, I'm a Sasa person now. <laughs> do, you, do you know what is Sasa? I'm a Sasa person now. He's lucky he's still working. So I've done my part. The body tells me it's becoming tired. I've got to take it a little bit slowly. Okay? Now the future belongs to who? Belongs to you. Hence I'm saying you've got to ready yourself. And uh, so that you are the future leaders like Mr. Morris Hatebe is. Now, having said that, if you look at the slide, let's take innovation. Innovation is about developing new methods of doing things. Innovation is about developing new ideas Innovation is about developing new products of what you want to do. So the environment is there. President has announced it is giving you that opportunity. Come up with, be innovative. You see, you cannot sit and say somebody will bring a plate full of meat and rice in front of me. You've got to come out with innovation and say, how can I get a plate of full of meat and rice and vegetables and thereafter a nice dessert. Therefore, you've got to think, you've got to come up with methods, you've got to come up with ideas, you've got to come up with new products that can make the country really move on and move forward. And that can only be done by you, the young people in this house today. Now, those two words are very key to me because if you're innovative, you will have something to do and you will participate and all of us will grow the economy of the country. You have just said that, you have just heard from Morris that we have entered in a technical recession. Now, how are we gonna come out? We can't say the government will see what to do. We must get involved. We are the citizens of the country. We must come out with new ideas and let our ideas be known. Let our products be known. Let our ideas that we are shaping around the corners and meetings like this be known by government. And let's be involved in shaping this all the time. Now you must have the capacity to do that. You must have the capacity to really get or seize the opportunity of getting in there and cut a little bit of a cake and eat as well. And we normally say the earliest bird catches the fertile worm. And that's, we should be there. That's what we should be doing. Let's, let's look at the next slide. Now, I've been asked today to speak about that topic. That's what I've been asked to talk about. Now, and I've been asked to sketch also a little bit about my background of life and so on. Maybe you want to know that it's a horrible one. I didn't want you to hear it, uh, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Now, I was born in the 50s. You can already see in which years I am now as I'm standing in front of you. And that time, it was still during the time of apartheid. By the way, you can move into the next slide. Uh, oppressive laws were still eating us. It was not an easy time to live. Now, I'm saying that I grew up under those conditions of very great poverty that time. And I'm saying that I'm a firstborn of 27 children at home. And my father, my father was a polygamist. And uh, out of my own mother, only 14 children. And the, other ma and, the, and, and the other mother, 14 children, actually. We were 28, 
by the right, not even 27. And I was the one to see the sun first shining. And uh, so I was there for some years. <laughs> now you can imagine uh, that uh, the life was a very big struggle for me. How do you maintain 28 uh, siblings, uh, yourself, and uh, as a parent, and those days they were not working because I grew up on a farm, by the way. I did not grow up in a beautiful city of, oh, I did not grow up in a beautiful city of Soweto, of um, Johannesburg, Kempton Park. I was on a, literally on a farm. So basically, we were misused by those who were farmers. As young boys and young, very few. I want to thank my father today. He is no more. He died at 62. My father had taken me to his other brother on another farm so that I can be able to get little education, not that much. And it was hard because the family went to tell the boss, that is the bus on the farm. Do you know what is the bus? The bus is just simply the boss of the farm that this man has hidden his child somewhere. He must come and work on the farm. Remember we were working six months on the farm and another six months they could release you to go and do your own things just for staying on a farm. No pay, nothing. You get a bag of ma ma maize, maize meal once a month and you get a, tin, a bucket of milk twice a week so that the children can grow. That's literally what happened behind, behind us. But I thank my father because he thought I should go to school and I managed to get that little education and uh, I made use of it. How God helped me, only him knows. But he helped me, he kept me alive, here am I. But let me tell you a very amazing story that out of all those children that you see today, none of them slept hungry even a single day. None of them was naked even a single day. None of them could not be housed. We all had a roof. We had to build ourselves at that tender age and help our parents. So I was called early back in my school years to go and look after the siblings at home because my father was not working and my father was very sick by that time. That's a little background, let's leave it there. I'm sure you've got a bit of it today. You are lucky. You have the government today that uh, has completely changed the syllabi at the schools. It's no more the Bantu education that you, we were educated under. You have got the same syllabi, all of you. You write the same examination paper. You go to universities. You still get a little bit of funding from government. I know it's not enough. We were not given anything. Schools, we had to build ourselves. They didn't build any schools. If you wanted a school in those homelands, we had to stand up as parents and contribute or donate the little amount of money we have and build mud schools for our children to be at school. So that's how life difficult was it. Now the whole, my life was struggle. And I had to find a job at an early age and jobs were not there. So I literally took the responsibility of my sibling and everything to make sure that things goes well with them. And I never thought that, by the way, I'm not sure why these people take me out of school so early to come and look after the people who do not even belong to me. They are not my children. I never said like that. But I saw them as my brothers and sisters who are in the same situation like me. 
Now we say in Zulu, I did like the women would do. Basadi baswara tipaka Do you understand that language? I don't know how to translate it into English. Huh? What do you say it in English? In difficult times, women would stand for any situation. At times, men run away. But women will not forsake their families. I can tell you about my wife. I can tell you about other women I know. Doesn't matter how difficult the situation is. She would say to me, we go. And we're going to do this. And it will be done. Now, this brings me to a very important point. Let's go to the next. Yeah, that one. That's right. The responsibility. As young fellows today, and young entrepreneurs maybe, let me just give an example of what leadership means in terms of responsibility, because I'm going to ask you to be responsible. Mitt Romney is one of the senators in the United States of America. You know Trump is facing the issue of impeachment. You are aware of that. But he succeeded. They will not impeach him. But let me tell you what Mitt Romney did. About two weeks ago, he voted against Trump and voted against his own party. Now, why did Romney do that? Who can tell me? Just think, why did he do it? He voted against his own president, against his own party, and he said, this man should be impeached. He's wrong. He's done wrong things. Why did he do that? Now, that's where responsibility comes from. You know, there's one thing that we've got to think about. We must not be responsible for little things that doesn't take us anywhere. The first thing that came into Mitt Romney was the interest of the country, the interest of South Africa, not the interest of an individual. Now, our interest should be the interest of our country. Are we taking South Africa forward? Are we going to take a decision that we are responsible in getting ourselves involved in the economy, building the economy of this country? We will come with, we'll be innovative, come with new ideas, products, methods of working, and be committed in your country? Or are you going to say, I'm running away now. This country is poor. I'm going to the US. I'm going to London. I will come back when they build their economy. Now, quote, leadership is about taking responsibility, not making excuses. If you make excuses, you have not yet started to be a leader. You've got to take responsibility and start beginning to find answers for the challenges that you have. And once you begin to do that, you've begun to move in the right way. Now, Romney was responsible of setting an example even during the most difficult time in the US. Remember, he was a, he's a politician. Remember, his job was at risk. He could have been fired, or he will still be fired for taking a decision that they think it's wrong. But in his mind, he's made up a decision of responsibility. And that is that of putting his country first. The country must exist. The country must live. The people must live in that particular country. Now, leadership also requires 
that one take responsibility to influence the future. It's us who can influence that future to change things for better, to influence future leaders like Mr. Hadebe is doing right now. We are trying to influence you that you can influence other people for the better future. We should not be stuck in the present. This is about seeing a bigger picture and being inspired to pursue it. Yes, we don't have jobs. The majority of the young people today are jobless. Yes, there's still inequality in the country. Yes, unemployment in the country. We see factories closing, mines closing down. But leadership tells us that we should think more bigger than that and say, what is it that we can do for our country? We need to move forward. We are giving birth now. We're bearing children. What type of a country are we building, all of us? And we've got to be thinking about those things. We need to get these things. We need to think. We need to solve the challenges that we have. We can't be panicking all the time, but we've got to come and find answers, all of us as we are sitting here. That's being responsible. Now, all of us sitting here have been part of that responsibility since I started leadership. I was lucky because I started leadership at an early age. At school, I was a chairperson of the debating society, and I was also the secretary of the teachers' union, as Mr. Morris has said earlier on, and I was the president of South African Student Christian Movement also. I started my leadership in early stage, and that told me that I need to be responsible all the time. And you continue with that. You put it in your heart and your mind as you wake up in the morning every day. Now, this brings me to a second challenge that we, need, we, we should be facing, selflessness. Now, you can't be selfish as a leader, you must be selfless. Now, selflessness is when you concern yourself with more with the needs and wishes of others than with your own. Look at what your chairman is doing. I mean, he doesn't have to be here. He's got a wonderful job. Huh? He can stay there, look after the company he's working for, why did he get a promotion to be a vice chairperson? That's that very big position. You know, I was in business and three of my businesses could not succeed. And I will tell you where I made a mistake. And one of those businesses was this man. At that early age when he was transforming Sasol. What was that first filling station, Morris? Excel, Excel. Excel, the Excel group when he was still doing the Excel group. I gave him a call because I saw also was reading from, I think, Sasol website. I saw this name. I said, I was, I'm going to talk to this young man. He must come and help me. I want to be in business. I called him. I said, I want a filling station. You know, he drove from Johannesburg that time. I'm sure now he's driving a very big car. But that time he was driving a very mini little car. And he came to me out in Middleburg in the Platteland. Do you know what Platteland is? He came there. And he came to meet with me. But guess what? He made it sure that I get that business. And I got it. But it was messed up by my, by my partners because I had partners. But all businesses I had, I had a bookshop. It was not successful. I had a bottle store. It was not successful. <laughs> uh, I had a filling station. I had a filling station. I, I had to do away with it. But you know what was the reason? 
The reason was because I was absent yeah. in the business. Yeah. I was not involved in the business. I trusted too much yeah. other people to run the business on your behalf. Yeah. Now, never make that mistake. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like giving your family to other men to say, run this family. I mean, you come to, they will definitely steal from your family. They will. Definitely. They will do that. And I realized that very late. But because I was busy with the politics of the country, that was another thing that made me to stay out of that business and resolve the problems of the country. That was another thing. I, I will be telling you what has driven me in all these positions that I've been running. So I'm going to start again. <laughs> I'm going to start again. Now I'll have a little bit of a chance to run that business myself. I'm putting that challenge to myself. Now, <laughs> positive leadership is about selflessness. Always remain positive. Never be negative. It places one in a position to think about the needs of other people. Leaders think about unleashing the potential of others so that they can achieve greatness. Yeah. Am I correct? Don't think about yourself. That's being selfish. Think about what can I do for other people. I now know this thing. It's in my mind. What can I do to help those people? And by doing so, as they grow, you grow higher. They make you grow. You can't grow yourself. Remember that. The position we get and we're promoted, it's because other people see your work and people compliment you. And then everybody's the leadership says, oh, okay, he's a good guy. Let's promote him to another higher level. So think of the other people. Now today, we use the term servant leader. Okay. Now there's a reason for that. That's to define a leader who is selfless. You serve. When you serve, you don't serve yourself. You serve the community you live in. You serve your country. You sacrifice a lot of things so that your country can grow, so that your community can grow, so that other leaders can grow. A servant leader is defined as a person who focuses on enriching the lives of individuals and improving the organizations and communities they serve. And this can be summed up in other leaders' words as we rise by lifting others. That is how we rise. And even God bless you because you help other people. And God increases you. You know, there is this thing every day when we go to church on Sunday. We give to church. Those who go to church, I don't know. But, but don't give to crooks. Uh, because there are many of them today, okay? And we believe that even if I've got two cents, what you can afford, three cents or 20 cents, you give. Let's help those poor people. I spoke about poverty, extreme poverty. South Africa is still living in extreme poverty. Now you people live in a city, you don't, you should be seeing it better. Look at the street kids around Johannesburg around Cape Town. Look what criminality is doing to our society. Look at what uh, drug abuse is doing to our young people. Look at all those things. Destroys our leadership with all the intellect they have. Now we should do all these things in order for us to rise, to lift other people should be our duty in our aim. Now the opposite of selflessness is what I call selfishness. Now what do selfish people do? 
the four things there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I don't like to talk about the negatives. But the selfish people manipulate you. That's what they will do. They are not open. They are not transparent. They will plot and scheme because they are selfish. They, will, they are self-centered. They don't want to share their ideas. They don't want to come out with new things. They don't want to talk to people. They're only looking at themselves. They disregard other people's feelings. They ask us to break all the time, all the time. But our job is to do what? Is to build all the time. If the wall falls or the brick shifts, take it back. Put that all up again. I will talk about that very soon. Now, let me tell you why I'm saying that. You will, I will refer you, I'm not going to talk about this one, but I'm just going to quote Professor Smith of the University of Stellenbosch, at the business school of Stellenbosch. He says, we must all take responsibility to ensure what we always do, that we always do good and that we influence our environment and those around us to do good as well. Because demonstrating good morals behavior, it's a good thing. You must do good things. Good behavior in public, in society, whatever you're doing, you've got to demonstrate that. As Professor Smith argues, it's not reserved, this is not reserved for prominent or influential people. I therefore say that as young entrepreneurs, you must take responsibility to act in the interest of the common good. We all of us. Now, I was asked, what do I expect from the young people today? This is one thing that I'm expecting from you. We must act in the interest of common good. I will repeat this in the coming slides. Let's go to another slide. Now, I moved on from that. Mr. Hadebe said I participated in the negotiation at Codesa. Do we still remember what Codesa is? and also in the multi-party negotiations. Now, I did not just negotiate only Babhadev. I was chairing that body. Yeah. I was the chair of that body. Now, you can imagine how difficult was it. Take yourself and put yourself in my boots. Praveen Gordon was chairing the council where the final decisions were taken. I was chairing the forum where the substance were discussed. How do we move South Africa forward? Now, I was the chair of that body, both Cortesa and multi-nation and multi-party forum. Now, there were different stakeholders there. The views were divergent. They could not just gel together. But when you are a chairperson of any organization, you think of the common interests that the people have. Now, what I had to think about was all those things that would drive South Africa, I mean, to move forward. Remember, some of the people were coming from the bush, fighting in a liberation struggle, fighting for democracy. Some were still in the apartheid era, wanted to keep it so that it exists for more. Now, when you are a chair, you've got to do what I'm saying. I'm coming to another point now, listening to different views. We don't think the same as we sit here, am I right? We think differently. 
Now, you need to open the trade-offs in order to reach agreement in pursuit of a common good. I'm coming back to that common good. Now, I had to listen to all these people chairing the whole day and the whole night and listen each and every one and analyze the debate and pick up the group of things they disagree with and take those they agree with and put them back to them and say, are we agreed on this? Yes. And I count them, I begin counting them. Then I say, oh, okay. We have 10 things that we agree with. We have got only two people that we differ with. Can we move? And I say, yes, we can move. We can debate those other things later on. Now, leadership. So, good leadership values the power of negotiation over destructive means such as armed conflict as a means of finding lasting solution. Now, you've got to be sharp. You've got to think and negotiate. At times, you give what you like the most to the person you are negotiating with. And at times, he also gives to you what he likes the most for the sake of the common good. That is what was happening at the World Trade Center. That's part of leadership. You don't want to take everything. Otherwise, you'll never move anyway. You're going to move back to war again. Let's take countries like Sudan, a countries like what? Uh, what is happening in the Middle East? All those countries there. Take countries like Syria, what is happening there? Why can't they agree around the table? Now, South Africa has set a very good example of agreeing around the table. We shocked the whole world. How did we make it? With divergent views like we had politically, socially, we had to agree and say South Africa should move forward. And we have a democratic country today. Let's move to another slide. Now, after the negotiations, we drafted the interim constitution. It took us into what we call Transitional Executive Council, of which I was a member, but Morris talked about it, and I was selected to Parliament to be a member of Parliament. And I also serve in a constituent assembly where we drafted the final constitution. And I chaired chapter four of the constitution that deals with Parliament, the executive, the provinces, the municipalities, and all that. Okay. Now, what has driven me to do all those things as a leader? There are four things there. I'm not going to get into detail about them. I'm sure you can see them. Uh, it can shift a little bit. Eh? That one is too far. I've got a very bad eyesight. But anyway, I've been driven by the universal accepted values. Now, what are those? Constitutionalism, adherence to democratic practices when taking decisions, being people-centric and always thinking about and acting in the interest of the people. That's what a leader does. You don't act in your own interest. You act in the interest of the people. You have to have some certain goals that you want to achieve. Secondly, adherence to ethical conduct. Now, what is ethical conduct? For an example, this speaks to the key moral principles that include honesty, that include fairness, equity, dignity, etc. You've got to have those qualities. If you don't have them, you can't be a leader. Unfortunately, you cannot. The third thing is technical ability. Now, what is technical ability? Knowledge of the mandate of the committees in parliament, whose mandates were those overseeing the different sectors in government. In my case, this required an understanding of the technical requirements for the functioning of different committees, such as the budget. That was very important for me. Where is the pace of the country going to? What is it going to do? How do we oversee it? I had a very big interest there. I actually then convinced parliament 
because some of these things you don't know, to form what you call a budget committee. And when I left for the US in 2014, it started to exist. And I'm happy that things are being done better now. Today. <laughs> the last point, which is not there, is it there? Oh yeah, no, there it is. I like that one the most. I want to dwell, just give me three minutes there or two minutes. That is turning a great vision into practical reality. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have that, don't be a leader. Don't. Sit down, go home, you see, because when you lead people, you must have a vision. What is it that you want to achieve? How are you going to implement your vision? How do you going to reach your goals so that it becomes a practical thing? Okay? If you don't have that vision, that dream, just stop doing it because you will not be successful. There must be something that drives you. There must be something that has driven you to form ULP. There must have. And that's why we are, we are where we are today. One could say that there is nothing as difficult as turning a great vision into practical reality. It's very difficult. It's not easy. It is a mammoth task. It requires clear vision. It requires patience. You can't be angry with people, turn the papers upside down. You must have patience and you must have the stamina. Okay, eat enough and have the courage to do it. Otherwise, just stop doing it. As I'm, don't even start if you don't have those. Leaders do, do not only sell the big picture. They must at all right level deal with what is required to turn their great vision into reality. When you dream, always my vision must be reality. Now, this is what I'm expecting from you. It's my second point that I'm making. I'm expecting you to practicalize your vision. There's nobody who's gonna come with a teaspoon and food and feed you like a small baby. You're gonna do what I said earlier on. You're gonna be innovative. You're gonna have your vision. You're gonna practicalize it then you are okay. You know where you are going. Now that's very critical. Out of all those other things, maybe just underline that. And if you can take that home tonight, I'll be very happy. Don't take too many things in your mind. Pick up one or two things and take them home. Now, I also became the leader of the second house. Do you know the second house in parliament? Yeah. That is called the National Council of Provinces. And you've got the National Assembly. I had dual job to foresee that house and also together work with a speaker to run parliament together. But my main function as a chairperson that worried me the most was to bring the three spheres of government to work together. Because I could see a division uh, of some of the people not understanding. The constitution is very clear. It says the three spheres of government are interrelated and interdependent. Do you understand that? The three spheres of government, do you know the three spheres? The three spheres of government, not branches. There are branches of government. There are spheres of government. These are two different things. Now, three spheres of government is your national government led by the president himself and his cabinet, okay? Then you've got the provinces led by the premier and their MECs. Then you've got the local municipalities led by the mayors and their councils, whatever the case may be. And there are three branches of government. That's your parliament, that's your government, that's your judiciary. Now, I was worried about that. 
the interdependency and interrelatedness. I had to work on that and make sure that it works so that national government does not impose to other spheres of government. They should understand what national government is doing. What the other hand does, the other hand must know. The openness, because some of the laws which are, are made by us at national parliament affects the provinces and affect the municipalities. And they should know how they are going to implement them. And how do you approach them to agree to that type of a policy? Hence, one needs to rely on accurate and timely information all the time. You've got to check and check and check, consult, consult, talk to the leadership. The last thing I want to talk about, then I sit down. It's my position I occupied as an ambassador of South Africa to the United States of America. Do you have that slide? Yeah. Now, I am saying this simply when you look at the slide. Am I still on time, Good Morris? Okay. Uh, if you look at that, I had to say to myself, what are the things that I should have in my mind as an ambassador? There is what we call Foreign Service Code of Conduct. You read all those protocols and you, you are given a task to do and everything. But the main task of the ambassador is to represent his country in a foreign country. Represent your president in a foreign country. If you are a bad ambassador, you can turn upside down the relationships between your country and that foreign country in one minute. In, by using one word only, you can flame the whole South Africa. Now, I had to be very careful because I was leading, representing the country, I mean, our country, in a foreign country, which consider itself, by the way, as the best country in the world. They've got the best military in the world. Well, they say they are the richest in the world. I'm not too sure about that. They say the economy is very good. I don't, you never speak bad about the country in which you are posted, remember. Because your job is to create relationship between the two countries. We need what we call foreign direct investment into the country. And they need us to export our goods to them. So as an ambassador, you have to drive that vision very clearly. You've got to understand what you are doing. You've got to understand the policy of your country. You've got to teach the foreign countries about that. It's very important because they don't understand our policies. Why do we have BEE? That's a question they've been asking me. Every meeting, I will get that question. And then I had to relate the background. You know, the apartheid system was bad. The black people were not involved in the economy. We trying to address that. Everybody to be involved. Everything to participate. Everybody to participate. Everybody to create jobs. I had to explain. How does it work? You know, all those arithmetic things or the mathematics things that are happening there, what, how many shares you must give to the company and all, I need to sit down and teach them like babies. They read it from the, uh, from the website, but they don't understand it. Now, I said to myself, I need to be selfless in this position and share with the people about the good of my country. Don't go there and tell the people how bad your country is. We don't do those things. Even if you don't agree with your father, you don't go and tell the public how bad your father is and how bad your mother is. Do you do those things? You don't do them. But I said, I need to be selfless. I need to listen to different views. Because if you listen at different views, one job as an ambassador, you've got to assist your country to shape its policy in relation to the 
foreign country where you serve. If you are good friends with that country, your country might say, yes, Ambassador, you are right. I think we should change the traveling documents for that country and allow them to enter the country without a visa. I don't take decision, I implement decision as an ambassador from my country. It might be difficult at times, it's very difficult. If you don't have an answer, don't answer. Find a way to say something in a different way. Check with home that what you want to say is correct. Now you've got to be listening carefully. Being driven by the universal accepted values, I've said them earlier on. You remember them? Right. Technical ability, you've got to read and empower yourself. Display ethical, ethical conduct all the time. Now you can't go to a function and then when you go out of the function, people are pulling you this side and that side and they are carrying you out of the function. You understand what I'm saying? You're misbehaving. You're not, you're not supposed to lead and represent your country. You always have to be presentable, yeah. like I am now. You've got to be presentable. When people look at you, they must see the ambassador. You can't walk like as if you're looking after the ship in the field. You can't do that. There are certain things that you've got to do. Using accurate and timely information for decision making is very important. You know what my, what my greatest difficulty and the challenge that I had when I was in the US, I'll just mention one, is the day when Trump tweeted to our president at two o'clock in the morning. And I just got 30 minutes of my sleep. It was so nice, you know, I was sleeping. And this side Trump was tweeting about the land issue. And when I woke up, I saw all this news in the world. I said, my goodness. What am I going to do? Nobody consulted me. Nobody. But I had to find an answer. And tell the side of the story. Of the South African people and the South African government. Why addressing the land issue? And I had to tell the truth on what is in the Constitution. And begin to teach them why is government doing that. So I'm saying there are challenges. There are not just good things in leadership, but you must know how to address those challenges. Don't send panic messages. Always calm down the people, because when you panic, you don't think correctly. Your mind is sort of upside down. Having said that, the leader must be versatile. As an ambassador, I had to be versatile. Now, versatility is simply the ability to adapt and or to be adapted to many different functions or activities. Or being able to change easily or to be used for different purposes. You've got to be versatile. You can't be rigid all the time. But as I say, you must say the right thing Get the latest information. Don't talk old things that does not exist. Remember, people are reading. Remember that. They will check you. And they will tell you, some of them know more things about your country than you know. And when they correct you publicly, it's going to be very painful. So it's important for you to know what you are talking about. Now, in the fast-changing global economy, one needs to be able to shift gears very quickly and learn things that he or she knew little about within a short space of time. Staying relevant is what sustained business in the day-to-day -day and age. So you must adapt to constant change. That's what I'm expecting from you. You must adapt to a constant change. The world is moving very fast. I don't know how many of us are ready for digi digitalization of the country. Can you get into e-business today? Are you ready? E-education, 
Are you ready? That's what the world is doing today. Everything is going to be E, 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 E. Everything. Are we ready to do that? I'm not too sure. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is important that in order to be versatile, you must expand your knowledge so that you are not found to be out of your depth when there is change and new opportunity knocks. You must always be ready. You can't be ready for a promotion when you are not ready for it. <laughs> you can't start a business when you are not ready for it. Things are changing. Whilst you're running your business, you can't run it in the old method. No, take a, you're still taking a piece of paper and a pen and writing how many tin of fish you've got on the shelves, how many cents you've collected today, how, many, how much running. No, things have changed. Modernize your business. Okay. Hence, at the beginning, I emphasize the importance of being innovative. That is the ability to challenge yourself to always come up with new ideas so as to stay relevant and be able to claim a stake in the economy. All right? Now, I want you to go and read, next slide, I want you to go and read about, uh, all right, go and read about that. I'm not going to talk about it. That's Tony Blair Institution. You, you all have read about it. Tony Blair Institute. He runs that institute. Go to that website and read how Tony Blair is running that institute. His job is to try to cut the long road to executive leadership into a short case study of a leadership. What should you do? What should you do things? How should you get things done? How to achieve results? He runs it perfectly because of the experience he gained when he was a prime minister. Just go and read that. I'm not going to waste your time talking about it. In short, I'm ending now. You might be elected to a highest office in the land, but as a leader, you do not stop learning. As a leader, you do not stop learning. You learn all the time, which is my last insight that I had as an ambassador. Learn more as you rise up so that you can continue to empower more people. Because when you are empowered, you can empower other people. Then you are selfless. Remember that, what I said. As, you as other people rise, you also do what? You rise. As I speak today, I'm not teaching you anything, but I'm learning also from you. So I grow. And lastly, and most critically, a leader must always be prepared for times of crisis. One day you're going to hit crisis. You must be prepared for that. This is where information and knowledge comes in very handy. One must be present and always available. Underline those two words. In times of crisis, one must always be present. When your business is in the business, you've got to lead and change the situation and bring it to normal. Don't run away and go and call other people. Lead, but consult the people who've got the knowledge. They can help you. They can empower you more. You must learn to communicate, including engaging the media, so that the people don't fear. But one must be informed and know clearly what to say to allay public fears. So you must complete, uh, communicate very clear, and you must know what you are communicating. I have put up there uh, the last slide. Is this the last one? I thought there was something there. If it is not there, I will make sure that you get it. There is a link I want you 
It's not there, no? Okay. But there's a link, I will give it to the uh, guys who are preparing for these discussions. I want you to go there and read how do people, for an example, communicate in terms of the coronavirus that we have today. The whole world is panicking because of that. And we are told it's, all, it's already in Africa. We have started panicking. I said to the chairperson, you are coughing. I don't know when are you seeing the doctor. So you must see the doctor very quickly. But uh, let's not go there and make the people fear, but let's tell the people how can they deal with the issue. I'm sure the government is giving us enough to read about that. Mr. Chairperson, thank you for giving me some time to talk to you. Thank you very much. They came for the sunshine, but bewildered guests at this Tenerife hotel have been... Thank you very much. Round of applause one more time for our guest. Thank you. We're going to do uh, maybe one round of questions and uh, three hands. If there's three people that want to ask questions, we've got one hand over here. Richard, can you just move over? And there's two there. And uh, anyone more? Okay, I've got one also. They've got people, we've got people watching online from Rustenbeck. So I'll read the last one online here. Christoph, you can go ahead, man. Okay. State your name and then your question. Okay, I'm Nontlantla Mona. And thank you for being here with us this evening and obviously sharing your leadership insights. Um, I strongly believe in the saying, um, there's this ongoing onslaught of the most experienced and seasoned leaders who are appointed into us major state-owned entities. Um, I, I suspect there is more to this problem uh, than just it being a leadership crisis. 
uh, we continue to toy around with the idea that maybe the solution, the permanent solution, is to go towards the privatization of all our major uh, state-owned entities because we are finding that we, we say the people that are there to lead, guide, and, and take these institutions to the next level are, are seemingly in, incapable to do so. So you have, after listening to you today, you you definitely a person to ask this question because you've told us about your journey and where you've played a role in our democracy, in our administration, in parliament and in government. And obviously you understand better the structures, the policies, and all the decisions that need to be taken, say we go privatization. So my question in a nutshell is to really get your views on this privatization of major state-owned entities. Uh, is it really the answer? And what is it that could be done differently to make these entities work? Because I understand that in as much as there's a service delivery uh, mandate, they also need to be equally commercially viable. So I'd really like to tap on your experience, your knowledge, and obviously your guidance as to what is really your view of the solution to this ongoing crisis when it comes to our major state-owned entities. And obviously, understanding the effect that an ESCOM saying there's load shedding for a week, what it has on our economy, and obviously what the world is viewing South Africa in terms of how we're performing and how we're running these entities. Thank you. Christoph, next one. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lon Piles Kosana. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Mahlango for, for sharing his journey with us. Looking at everything that you've achieved with the little education you had, if you were to advise a young person, um, and this time, who is willing to give up on education and drop out with no strong reasons while our government is providing, is providing us with free education? What will you say to them? Thank you. Thank you. And then the last question coming from Dr. Mutwahai from Rastenberg. What's been your challenges as a Christian leader at the high level of government? Okay, those are the three questions. You can go ahead and answer. Can I repeat the challenge of what? What's been your challenges as a Christian leader at the high level of government? Okay. I had no challenge at all. It's very simple as a, pre, uh, as a Christian and as a person who believes in God, I stayed in prayer all the time. Yeah. It didn't matter. <clears throat> It didn't matter to me whether people were differing with me or they were fighting with me, but I would, say, I, would, I would seek guidance from God all the time because he tells us that if anything, uh, we want to get anything right, we can leave it to him. There's nothing that he cannot resolve for us. Seek the answers from above, you will always get the above. Yes, I know that there are politicians who are not Christians, our constitution allows that, different of association, difference of association and beliefs in the country, but I never had a challenge altogether as a Christian. I'm happy, I'm still happy today. And it actually protected me in many things. <laughs> Mama Skosan, Skosan, did you say, what would I say to the young people about free education? What did you say? What will be your advice to a young person who is not who is willing to give up on education oh. while our government is providing us with oh. free education? My advice is very simple. Take the quotation from the old man, our leader, respected leader Mandela. Education, it's a tool that can help you to solve the challenges of the world. Yeah. I, I think I'm quoting it. I might leave in one, two words and so on, but I'm, I'm 100, almost 100% 100 correct. Those who knows that quotation. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, there's nothing you can do without education today. Yeah. Nothing. 
Just absolutely nothing. That is why I say kept on empowering yourself. Now you may not be in an institution. You may not be in an institution, let's agree, because of many other uh, challenges that you have. There's no money at home. Government cannot fund everybody to go to school. You know our economy is very weak. But ladies and gentlemen, you can go to library and read. You can buy a book and read. You can empower yourself with the current news. Today, nobody has got no cell phone in the house today. You all have cell phones, okay? You can get to social media. You can empower yourself, just know what is happening. When I live here, I haven't seen seven o'clock news, five o'clock news, because I'm not home. But I'm not going to sleep without opening my YouTube and listen at the news. Because I want to know every day, as a politician and as a leader, what is happening in my country? And where can I get involved and assist? So I want to encourage young people that take this very serious. Now there are people that think that things will just happen. It's not like that. Things are not just going to happen. You've got to make things happen. And that's in order for you to make them happen, you must sharpen yourself. No blunt knife can cut a T-bone steak. It must be sharp. And that's the type of a leadership. You remember I talked about leadership. I said innovative. Be innovative in order to participate in the economy. If you are not educated, how are you going to be innovative? How are you going to do all these things? We don't expect you to be, you know, many degrees like Mugabe had about what? Eight degrees. <laughs> we don't expect you to that. But at least be knowledgeable, be empowered, have the knowledge of what you want to do, of the dream and the vision that you want to practicalize. The last question was privatization of the uh, state enterprise. Now that's a policy issue, uh, Mamona, is that, am I correct? Now that's a policy issue. It's a very sensitive, difficult issue that needs stakeholders to sit down and like a Cordesa thing I was talking about. Sit down. Our country is, has a challenge about the state enterprise. Unions are saying the different things. Government is saying different things. This is what they want. Unions want this. Other people want this. So it has entered that terrain. Now the advice I can give where I am, I don't want to get into politics because I don't want to be in trouble unnecessary. But the good advice that I have seen is that the stakeholders have got to sit down and talk amongst themselves. This problem is not uh, unsurmountable. This problem can be resolved and can be resolved quickly. That's how positive I am. Thank you. Any closing, closing remarks? Or can we take a second round? Okay. Cool. There's uh, one over here. Another one? Oh, we just have one. Okay, great. Nobody else? Great, you can go ahead, sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity to Mr. Matlangi to share your your leadership, uh, I mean your, your journey of leadership. But yes, my name is Nkuru Leko, and I've got just a simple question here with regards to responsibility and uh, selflessness that you mentioned earlier. Like, uh, if you can just tell us a little bit further, like that uh, most of us as young people, we find ourselves being a bit impatient at times. We find ourselves in institutions or with a group of friends trying to start up something here and there or in any form of committee here and there. And in the process of time, maybe with foresight, you can see that maybe things are not going to work out here. Or maybe as my sister mentioned, of certain things in government or state-owned enterprises that uh, based on where we are and on current leadership that we have, things might uh, be going into a different direction, which will not lead us uh, in the right place we can go. 
So what then do you do as an aspiring leader or as a, as a civilian in whatever committee or situation that you find yourself? What do you do to, to, to can sort of better the situation or do you, do you, run, do you, do you, you change directions to go into a different thing that might seem to, to be working or you, you, you man up and be responsible and try to, to foster change? Like I heard you guys speaking of scripture here, I mean of Christian values here and there. Like scripture speaks of a prudent man who sees danger and hideth himself. But the foolish, you know, carry on and they they perish. So I just want to, to find out your wisdom that in situations of difficulty, even the based on the current leadership that you might be having, things might not look like they were turn out right. What do you do to you? Go seek out different help. I mean, seek out different alternatives somewhere else, and or you stay, even though you see that the ship is sinking. Thank you. I'm not sure whether I got your question right. Uh, are you asking that? What can you do? Yeah, I'm just asking that you, as an individual, what do you do in situations where you find yourself that in whatever committee that you are, the ship is sinking? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do you run away and not really run away? Do you go do something else or do you stay there? Here's the answer. I said to you, leadership, it's not an easy thing. You will definitely get the challenge. And I said, don't run away. I said, be available, be present all the time. When you get challenges, that is the time to think. In fact, that's not the time to think. It's the time to really think. Underline that. When you ask people to think, they think. But when you ask people to really think, you become their enemy. Do you get that? That's where the problem becomes. Because as a, as a leader, you've got to lead. Now, if you lead people and you run away when there are difficulties, what do you expect the people to do? What do you expect to happen about the company? What do you expect to happen about the government that you are leading? What do you expect to happen about your family? I leave my wife and my children in the house because I saw the line there. Well, no, it's a cheetah. Is it a cheetah? It, if it gets into the house, I run away. I leave my wife and my children with the cheetahs to eat them up. You don't do that. Eh? There, are, there are a few things you can do. Use your experience you have. If you don't have, consult. That's what I said. Talk to other people who have got the knowledge. Check what is it that you can do. You have this challenge. You know who are the best managers of the business. Let me talk about a business. Are the people who works for you. Talk about them. Don't tell them what to do. Ask them what can be done. I heard something today when I was talking with the chairperson that he gave some people a question and he left out for a dinner somewhere else. And when he came back, they've responded to the question. That's what you do. Call your people. Talk to them. Ladies and gentlemen, that's openness and transparency. We have this challenge in the business. What can we do? And you will find that the answer is sitting right here, not very far from you. So be versatile. You need to change the gear at times. That's what I've said. And uh, there's a, what we call game change as well. You need to come with strategies, new strategy, if the old strategy doesn't work. Thank you very much. Have you got any closing remarks and then... Any final closing remarks? Oh, myself. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of ULP. Thank you very much to the participants tonight. Uh, it has been wonderful to have an exchange and discussion with you. Uh, I will continue these discussions with other people uh, outside, and I'm prepared to. Thank you very much. Thank you. One word I got, selflessness. So I don't know which one you got. So I got that one.
and um, that was great. So we're quickly gonna, before I hand over to the chair, we just have uh, one uh, uh, slide, just 30 seconds. I spoke about MMI a little bit earlier. I just have a 30 seconds so you can see the website and exactly what we do. Street Institute, MMI, is raising Christian ministers who will impact the marketplace for Christ. Africa is in desperate need of educated Christian men and women who will take the lead in the business and corporate environment. MMI provide a platform where Christian business leaders can come to be skilled, mentored, equipped to not only flourish as business leaders, but be empowered marketplace ministers. Visit mmi-sa.com for more information. Thank you. So now we're speaking as a sponsor, and uh, that was Marketplace Ministry. It's a nine-month program. Earlier, I didn't specify how long it is. It's a nine-month nine month program, and then we only attend one Saturday a month. So it's not every Saturday. So you sacrifice one Saturday a month, you join us for nine months, and then you're going to be equipped with so many skills. Thank you very much. And without any further ado, let's welcome the chair to come and wrap up for us. Thank you. Thank you very much again for sharing your story. It's a brilliant story. And uh, what I like is that it's, it's, it's in working in government and in government structures. Most of the time we hear about business people. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Let me tell you, uh, you've got a real chance to, to succeed in business now. <laughs> I'm told by Theo there that uh, Kennel Sandals, who knows Kennel Sandals? Who, 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 who is Kennel Sanders? The guy who started the KFC was started it at 65. So, so you stand a chance. Uh, Theo, you said that Warren Buffett made his 90% uh, of his wealth from which age? From age? 7 0, Warren Buffett. When he was 70 years old, that's when he made 90% of his wealth. And he's one of the richest men on earth. So there's a real chance for you. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing your story, and we really appreciate Mama, thank you for coming with Obaba. We, uh, and it's always good. I like uh, uh, to, to, to see couples uh, working together because that's what we do here at DLP. We encourage family values also. I see Ross is really nodding. No? Thank you very much, Ross, uh, for coming. And uh, uh, Theo, any announcements? No announcement. So this is time for mingling and uh, sharing together and uh, exchanging cards, uh, meeting Bob Martha, working, and there's some uh, refreshments. There's some refreshments outside. God bless you.